All right. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Dorian, and today I'll be talking about multiplayer games with Phoenix Live View. I'm really excited to be here. I've been going to ElixirConf, I think, since 2015. Um, and it's really nice to be on the other side of it. And I'm super happy that uh, the team was able to make it happen despite uh, the disaster that is, that is 2020. So let's jump uh, right into the goals of the talk. So today I'm gonna to demonstrate a real life use case for Live View. Um, it's just gonna be a, a basic game and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the game server architecture that I chose um, and talk about a little bit about patterns of how to communicate between processes in OTP. Um, I wanna emphasize this is not just for games. Um, so games are a great use case, but this is also great for anything that involves multiple participants interacting with the same web application and needing to see each other and kind of like interact with one another. Uh, so basically I wanna share my experience and what I learned. And at the end of the day, I really wanna motivate you to build your own Live View apps because I think it's really fun and um, you don't have to write any JavaScript. Um, and if you do want to, you can always use hooks to kind of like have an escape hatch. The table of contents um, starts with uh, a little bit of the story and motivation behind the, uh, the game that I built. Uh, go a little bit into the architecture. Um, that's where we'll spend actually the majority of the time talking about like the OTP, functional core, uh, live view. Talk a little bit about garbage collection uh, and then recovering from errors and managing sessions and restoring state, which is related to recovering from errors. Live view testing, and finally, we'll touch just a little bit on deployment. A little about me, uh, my name is Dorian. I am a senior software engineer at Boulevard, and I'm the organizer at Chicago Elixir Meetup. And previous to Boulevard, I worked at a company named Hashrocket, and during lunchtime, we used to play board games. And one of the games that I particularly enjoyed is King of Tokyo. So we had some really epic lunches, um, but then uh, March 2020 hit, and then we all kind of found ourselves pretty much looking like that. So um, what I was thinking of doing is let's try to do a remote King of Tokyo game. So we set up a Zoom call. Uh, I have a camcorder, I pointed it down on the game. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with that. Uh, basically like the numbers are really small and the cards were hard to read and you have to kind of like flip the things and sometimes you'd throw the dice and they'll fall off the table. Um, not ideal. So I wanted to find a solution for that. So this is what it looked like on the first game. When I took the screenshot, I didn't really even know uh, that it was gonna turn into a talk. Um, and so I decided to solve this by building something cool with LiveView. This was not my first game that I built with LiveView. The, the previous one that I built, it's kind of like a playerless game. Uh, it's Conway's Game of Life, and that's uh, also on my GitHub. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the game just so you kind of get a good feel of what it's like to play it and some of the rules. So this is just an image containing all the different pieces in the game. Players choose one of six monsters um, and each of them come with like its own scoring board. And the scoring board contains uh, the victory points and health. And so the winner is the first person uh, to reach 20 points or the first, the only player to have any health. The dice can be re-rolled selectively up to three times. So you can decide, I want to keep the, the claws um, and then re-roll the rest up to three times. And then um, you have those, all the way in the right uh, top corner, you have those cubes and those are essentially a currency. And you can use those to buy power cards. Power cards, other than being uh, extremely beautiful, um, they, they really kind of changed the rules of the game and to implement them uh, was a little outside of the scope of what I was hoping for. So I did not actually go into implementing every rule change. So just to be clear about what this is and what this isn't, it is an emulation of a board game uh, and essentially it's just a fancy collaborative web app. So uh, that's why I'm saying it's a, it applies to everything. Um, what this isn't, it's not some 2D platformer game that has a lot of cool animations or anything like that. Um, and it's also not a full implementation of all possible game rules. 
So now we're dive right into a demo. Um, here you see some familiar names uh, joining into a game. And um, uh, Morty here is gonna try to sign in. Um, he didn't pick a character. And so uh, he sees a message the character is already taken. Uh, when he chooses another character, he can join in. Once everybody joins in, they, they all see each other uh, on the right-hand side on those cards. And then they can start interacting and updating some of the statistics and you'll see it updating uh, throughout everything, throughout all the screens. So I'm using um, incognito browsers essentially like uh, on the same screen, but you can see on the right hand side of each of the screens, the, the victory points updated for everybody. Uh, and the same applies for everything else. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture. Uh, just a simplified uh, version of the OTP design. Like what did I want to do in the beginning was just a game supervisor uh, that launches a bunch of game servers and all those game servers will register themselves through the registry. And that was kind of what I had in my head. The realistic uh, OTP architecture looks more like this. Uh, I know it looks scary, but it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so we've got the application and telemetry and endpoint. And those are things that you kind of get out of the box with Phoenix. And the application starts the game supervisor, it's a dynamic supervisor, and then the game server uh, is started from the dynamic supervisor, and that's a gen server. Uh, and then you, uh, that talks to the PubSub, and the PubSub talks to it as well. And there's also presence, which uses the PubSub. Games register themselves in the game registry, and the garbage collector kind of talks to all the, the, all the things and is able to kind of like determine what the state of the app is. So this is just in code what it looks like, the supervision tree. So it's, it's not uh, so mystical. It's, it's just a list of things, right? Uh, the only thing to notice here is uh, in the registry, we're using unique keys just so that uh, the codes are essentially unique there. So uh, the game server itself is just a gen server and it's fairly simple. It doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, it basically talks to uh, a functional course, and most of the game is implemented inside uh, just Elixir modules that don't do a whole lot. And um, the game basically talks to other modules like the chat message and the dice and game code and the player. And um, they all have like structs that kind of like represent the data structure, and they are the only ones that know how to update it. So essentially, uh, we, it makes testing a lot easier because when you're testing game logic, you don't have to spin up processes for that, right? You're separating your logic from, uh, the, from processes. So if you're not familiar with Live View, here's just uh, a one page crash course, right? If you ever done React, you'll feel right at home here. So we have uh, a render function that just renders some markup and you can have this of course in a separate uh, co-located um, uh, file, right? And uh, it has an assigns and you'll notice it doesn't actually use the assigns in here. So there's some uh, magic happening that allows you to take the assigns and then turn them into those. Um, these are non module attributes. This is essentially just like an accessor for the assigns, like some macro. Um, we've got some bindings here for clicking um, on those buttons. And then whenever a button is clicked, we're going to get a message that has this uh, decrement or increment uh, identifier then we can handle it over here in the handle event. Uh, uh, we also have a mount, and the mount allows us to set some initial values in the assigns. So a lot of stuff is managed through the assigns, and it's something to remember as we go forward. So in my case, I have uh, a couple live views. So I have the lobby live, and this is where uh, users kind of just come in, put their name, select a character, uh, select the game code or generate it or write it down and then uh, join. Once they're inside, um, they see a bunch of different things. And uh, one thing you'll notice here that you didn't see in the demo is I have all the dice in here and you can select which ones you want to keep and then reroll the rest. And then you see a roll count and you can even increase the number of dice that uh, exist. And that's all based on the rules. You can enter Tokyo or exit Tokyo and that's smart enough to know about how many players are in the game, whether this should be uh, Tokyo Bay or Tokyo City, uh, and so on. So there's like some rules that I implemented, but uh, I kept it to a bare minimum because the game is so flexible. Now, player groups, they don't want to see 
when, when you are playing with a bunch of your friends, um, you're in a room and you don't want to see people who are unrelated to your party um, and any of their data. So the way we separate those is by spinning up a game server, which is based on the gen server via dynamic supervisor, like I mentioned. Um, so let's look a little bit about uh, at the mechanics of how that works. So in the game supervisor, I have this function here. I, it's obviously abbreviated, but um, I'm calling it start game. I'm defining the child and I'm saying basically start the game server, which is a gen server and um, give it the code for the game. The code is just a struct. Um, and uh, for the restart strategy, I chose transient because we will wanna shut it down eventually using the garbage collector. So uh, that's, that's what we have here. And then we call dynamic supervisor start child with the current module. Um, now, once we have a server, we need to know how to access all the different servers for the specific uh, codes a user enter. Uh, so for that, I'm using the registry. It's really simple to use. So um, when in your game server, in the start link, you can just give it a name. And I'm using this via tuple uh, function. And what that does is uh, it defines which registry to use. It tells it to use the registry and then which reg registry to use and then what uh, identifier to use in that registry. And in this case, I have game ID, which is essentially a slugified version of the game code that the user enters. So. Uh, there's some characters we don't want there, and we want to use like maybe uh, dashes instead of spaces. So just to kind of like make it more consistent. Then to find a game server by a code, um, we have we're using basically the same function, and we're just taking the game ID, turning it into into this by a tuple, and then asking the gen server where it is. I have those helper functions that I use, and I found those to be really helpful. Um, so one is called by name where you give it a command and if it finds the PID, it will basically call that command on the gen server. Um, but if it doesn't find it, it will always return error game not found. And I have a similar one for cast by name. So that's just a pattern that I used that was really helpful, um, and really simplified things and removed some code duplication. Next, you saw all those cards. Um, you gotta know who's online. How do you know who's online? Well, that's where Phoenix Presence uh, comes into play. And this, this was my first time actually using Physic Phoenix Presence. And I gotta say, it's just been such a pleasant experience. Uh, just out of the box, there's not a whole lot that you have to do to configure it. And you just get a whole lot for nothing essentially. So it's, it's really great. And so uh, really great, great work for the team that worked on that. So just let's see how we wire that up. Uh, inside of our uh, live view, we have the mount that I mentioned earlier. In there, whenever the person joins, uh, we just call presence.track self because each live view uh, is essentially spinning up a process per user. So we're tracking this current process. Uh, and then we are giving it the game ID, uh, which will be really useful in a bit. And then we're only storing the player ID. So currently, um, we're not storing anything in the metadata. Initially, I did the mistake where I, I did store a bunch of player information in the metadata, and that proved to be uh, quite difficult to manage because then you have to keep it update, updated, and then you have multiple sources of truth. So that's something that I avoided. And instead, um, I'm using this uh, fetch method that uh, Phoenix Presence allows you to implement, where you give it a topic. So in this case, every time somebody calls presence.list to get the list of all the players, um, I'm basically injecting metadata that is uh, fresh directly from the game, ser game server. So the topic is gonna be the game ID. And at that point, um, I'm able to inject that into the metas. And then in the game live, uh, I have this essentially uh, event handler. So whenever I get called uh, with player players updated, um, what I do is I call presence.list on that game ID and I'm taking the players out and updating my internals assigns uh, for the game. So basically the players, the player list on the right will be updated with the people that are currently connected. Now you might be thinking, how do I push those updates? So that's where Phoenix PubSub comes into play. So um, whenever we mount, 
uh, here, right after I, I start tracking, I basically subscribe to Phoenix Pub Sub. So once I have a message, um, and I'm tracking on the same game ID. So once I have a message coming in, I can handle it. Um, in the game server, I can send messages out uh, via Phoenix Pub Sub broadcast, and then I give it the Pub Sub specifically that I created. Uh, give it the event and the payload. So here's an example. Whenever somebody rolls a dice, the dice will be updated. So we'll call it with this event, dice updated, and give the new dice state. I could be passing the entire uh, state of all the, the entire game, but you want to minimize the payloads that you're sending around if, if it's not necessary. Now, here's how we handle it on the live view end of things. Uh, we get a dice updated, and then we get uh, the dice state. And so once we have that, we can go ahead and update our internal assigns for the game and update the dice state, and then everybody sees the same dice. So that's how you share the same resource across everybody's um, data. Now, um, in the present side, we also get events whenever somebody leaves or joins. Uh, we're only getting it in the processes that we're actually tracking on presence. So uh, only the live view will get it, and that causes some issues. So um, like there is no not notification for when the last person leaves, which will lead us to the next topic, which is garbage collection. Uh, but here, every time somebody joins or leaves, I'm basically sending a broadcast to everybody. Go ahead and update your uh, presence list. So the game is over. At some point, all the users will leave the game and uh, empty game servers take up game codes, right? Like you use Elixir Conf, but now uh, other people want to use Elixir Conf. So essentially those are taken and all that data is still there. And if you let it grow at scale, obviously I didn't have scale here, but um, if you let it gr grow in, in scale, essentially what would happen is you'll have a memory leak. So you want to, uh, reap those processes as soon as nobody's using them. So um, in the game server, um, I still have access to presence. I can still call presence.list on the game ID. So I implemented this method called uh, presence player IDs. And you just give it a game ID, and then it just gives you all the IDs of all the players that are currently present. Then in the garbage collector, it, it is essentially a gen server that has a timer. Um, yeah, using just Erlang timer, I'm sending on every two minutes, I'm sending to myself this garbage collect message. And then this is the continuation of that. Sorry if the slide is a little cut off. Um, so here I'm going to the game supervisor and I'm asking it, give me all your children and then I'm gonna iterate on each one and essentially uh, get the game for that PID. And then from there, uh, I have the game ID and I can call presence player IDs. If I find that there, there are none, I can uh, call game supervisor stop game and shut it down. Now errors happen, right? It just, they're going to happen. So error recovery in Elixir is all about um, layering and isolation. That's at least how I like to think about it. So I'm gonna add another piece here to the diagram that I showed you before, um, and that's the Phoenix Live View process. So this is the process that runs for the user currently using the app. So if this process has an error in it and it crashes, it'll get restarted. It'll get restarted with the same parameters that it got in the beginning. Now those parameters, um, unless you include something in the URL, um, basically like they're gone, right? So um, assigns are gone, assigns are cleared, so this was the experience initially when I didn't have any error handling. Basically, you would uh, try to update something and boom, it crashes, the user is logged out. And when it happened live, uh, it kind of sucked because um, the user had to like rejoin. There was still like a ghost of them remaining in the background. And it's just like, was not a great experience. So the solution was to implement uh, sessions. And that was, actually a lot harder. So here um, we have the experience after the, the fix. Uh, when you click enter Tokyo, the app crashes and all the user sees is just like a little bit of a refresh, but everything is basically just works, right? Like they're, they were the left off. So that's the experience I wanted to have. 
Now, how did I do it? So sessions um, are not easily assigned to sockets. Uh, assigns are gone when you refresh. Um, and you can't just do socket put session. Uh, it seems kind of intuitive, but you can actually do that. So I had to go a different route, right? Um, usually live views are rendered using live routes. And that's what we're doing with the lobby live. Uh, with the game live view, I couldn't do that. I had to actually uh, render them from a controller. So we have more control over the con, like you do in a regular uh, Phoenix request. So that's when we separated those out. Uh, and then in the lobby live, we are calling a redirect. So whenever a user joins, we'll create a, a player for them. Uh, we start the game, we add the player to the game. And if everything worked as planned, meaning there's nobody else with the same name, uh, et cetera, then uh, we basically like call join and then we redirect to it. Then in the game controller, here we've got join. Uh, we're reading all those parameters from the query string. And then we are uh, building a new URL, putting some uh, sessions, in this case, uh, game ID and player ID, and then redirecting to the URL. So um, once we're there in the index, we call live render. And that's when we're rendering the game live view. Okay, so this is how we read it. So in the game live view, we have the mount, and then we have um, the session being read here. We take all those uh, parameters, and then we can read them directly from the game server to verify them. Uh, there are some pitfalls, and um, I'm just going to glance over it. But essentially, there were some errors that uh, basically didn't show up locally, but they did in production. That's something you don't want to have. Uh, kind of a common sense thing is to, yeah, go ahead and test it on the QA server. That's something that you should be doing anyways. Um, but uh, again, like this is like a small app. I didn't even have a QA server. Um, so something to, to keep note of, uh, this is still a pretty new library, right? Um, and, and that goes to the second issue is, again, this, it, it's a library that changes a lot. I had some issues with key events, and some of it were admittedly my fault. Um, but I couldn't read the, I couldn't understand why they were happening until I started digging into the change logs where I saw that the metadata for key events changed. So um, we are at 0 014, so it's kind of understandable that things are uh, constantly changing from underneath us, but it's, it's getting stabler and stabler. And I'm really happy with what I'm seeing. Um, another thing with key events, just make sure you don't have any browser extensions that capture them, uh, like Vimium. And again, common sense stuff. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about testing. So Phoenix Live View comes out of the box with this idea of gray box testing. Um, it's kind of similar to Detox in React Native, if you ever use that, um, where it, it's close to black box testing, where you would spin up a browser and access it as if you were a user. But it does have some knowledge about the internals. What you get as a result is a really, really fast execution time for, for tests compared to something that has to spin up a browser, consume memory, and so on. It's a lot less brittle as well. So that's another thing that I really like about it. I still feel like it's a work in progress. It's, it hasn't been too easy to, to use it. And it, it just keeps evolving. So um, I think Josette did a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen. So really kudos for all the work done there because I really don't want to install Chrome on my machine. OK, so I'll give you an example. Uh, it's kind of, it's a real example that I used that helped me detect a bug, actually. Um, maybe not the easiest one to follow, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. So a user cannot enter a game with no player name. So we get a con here. Uh, we're building the URL for the live view from the lobby. Um, here there's something really interesting happening and, and kind of like unintuitive for Elixir developers. So we have this like, okay, view HTML coming from the live. And so we're going to take this view and do some operations on it. So we're going to do uh, form, the form operation just to find the form. And then we're going to post the form and render submit. So we're basically calling submit on the form. And then once you render the view, uh, you get the HTML output of what the state would be at that time. Now, what's weird here is I didn't assign this to anything. 
So there's some mutation happening here. It's kind of sneaky and uh, pretty interesting. Um, but it works really well and it, it runs really fast. So uh, I have about five minutes left. So I'm just going to touch uh, briefly on deployment. So I use DigitalOcean for a lot of my things. I'm not trying to promote them or anything, but I just do really like DigitalOcean because it's lightweight. Um, I can use a $5 machine and run Elixir on it very easily. And I get like one gigabyte of RAM uh, and then 25 gigabytes of SSD and one CPU. So it's, it's really nice. Uh, I don't get any restarts to worry about like Heroku and it's much cheaper than Heroku or Gigalixir. Um, but to set it up, you have to do some stuff, right? Uh, so I basically used uh, Pulumi to set up infrastructure as code, uh, Ansible for the configuration management, meaning to uh, install the uh, uh, Elixir, Erlang, everything in the machine, all the apt packages and so on, configure security. Um, I'm using Distillery for packaging a release. And then for the delivery, I'm using eDeliver. And I have a blog post available for all of those. So um, some pitfalls I wanted to mention though, because those are pretty important. You have to set up a WebSocket connection upgrade if you're using Live View. Um, and, and there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but essentially what you have to do is you have to downgrade the HTTP version uh, in order to upgrade a connection. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and this is the path, the kind of like out of the box path that LiveView uses. So you'll have to do that in your Nginx if you're using Nginx. Another thing to note is uh, eDeliver is, hasn't gotten a whole lot of love recently and uh, it's got some bugs in it uh, that have been fixed and merged, but not released yet. And one particularly painful one that I spent a lot of hours on is uh, the one with the start arrow data. So if you're publishing new versions with version numbers, uh, you'll have like some really hard time trying to figure out why are things not showing up when they should. Uh, and then again, make sure you restart your Elixir server every time you deploy. It, it seems like common sense knowledge, but it's easy to forget if you're using eDeliver. Um, but a lot of time could have been saved uh, if I just always did it as a, as a script. So for the deployment, uh, I have a bunch of blog posts on the HashRocket blog that you can uh, find there. Uh, don't worry about copying this link right now because I will send the slides out on Twitter. Um, but yeah, they cover Pulumi, Ansible, Distillery, and eDeliver. It's like a, a three-part post. So what's next for this project? I want to implement power cards. Uh, just yesterday, I found this repo on GitHub that has all the cards and all their uh, write-ups in CSV. Uh, so it's really nice. And then uh, maybe WebRTC video chat. So really making the experience so that you don't really have to have a camera above the cards and um, basically just have like a really good experience using it. So in conclusion, I really think LiveView is awesome. Uh, it's an enabling technology. So even backend developers have never really done a whole lot of front end uh, can get into it. And um, it removes a lot of the overheads of JavaScript like bundling and uh, just weirdness of frameworks and how often they get released. Um, and then I, I really think it, it just gives you an unparalleled development experience uh, when combined with OTP and all the different processes and communications that you can do there. So just a, a few thank yous, um, just the Elixir Conference team and Jim, um, Chris McCorn, Jose Valim, and Phoenix Elixir core team, and everybody involved in those projects. Uh, Paolo for motivating me to do this talk. Uh, and Boulevard, my employer, please check them out. Um, and my friends at HashRocket. So for questions and comments, uh, I'll be around in the Hangout Zoom channel. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions now, but uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. Uh, ping me there. Uh, GitHub is where you find the source code, uh, my website. And then, um, of course, you can play the game live at thekeng.live. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>